like to thank my main collaborators at the moment and support from British and Russian research councils. And this is a bit of my own background, because I used to work in the Soviet Union, in Sweden, Canada, Japan, also collaborate with Russia, and I co-founded uh, the company D-Wave Systems, which, as you probably know, is at the moment the only, first and only, provider of uh, commercial quantum computing devices. I will say a few words about this a little later. And also some books, including this one on quantum engineering, and some introduction to quantum mechanics. So first of all, why this is all such a hot topic. Since uh, 1999, approximately, there used to be a great, a great progress in the development of quantum technologies. Yeah, by the way, please, if you have questions, ask them directly. So please, don't, be, don't uh, worry about interrupting. Okay? So, the whole thing was uh, launched by uh, the interest of uh, certain government actors in uh, the possibility of uh, breaking RSA codes, which is not, of course, the main thing that uh, quantum computers could or should do, and it's clearly not a good business, but it provided initial funding and initial interest. So since then, the main thing is that the effects which used to be restricted to the realm of very small, became more or less uh, routine at the mesoscopic or even macroscopic level. If you look at, say, debates raging in the 1970s, 1980s, whether it is possible to observe macroscopic quantum effects in superconducting structures, and uh, the idea the gist of majority opinion was, no, you can't because all these quantum effects are too fragile to be actually seen in reasonably large systems. And it turned out to be not true. Actually, now we have to thoroughly reconsider the way we are teaching quantum mechanics, not because quantum mechanics was proven to be wrong, quite the opposite. We are desperate to find a scale on which it starts failing. And we can't so far. So we have to work under the assumption that quantum mechanics should work on any scale. But then we need to just use different examples, use different kind of experiments for the first year students to explain what is the measurement, what is the quantum superposition, and so on and so forth. And we are indeed in the process of the second quantum revolution. The first quantum revolution happened, say, in the mid-20th century. Of course, quantum mechanics was built by that time, but its technological impact started producing results only after that. Well, I don't even uh, mention, say, nuclear technologies, but the essential things were semiconductor technologies, lasers, superconductors, which profoundly changed our life. We are using all these technologies all the time, not even noticing this. And they all use very limited set of quantum properties. Essentially, all of them deal with the quantum effects involving single quantum states, one particle state or two particle state. Even the famous superconductors, when people say, well, we are considering a superconductor as a macroscopic quantum system, it is not actually true. 
because it is not quite macroscopic quantum system. The quantum correlations in the superconductor touch on say, four single particle states. And huge successes of quantum solid state theory also restricted to problems which can be solved when you consider factorized quantum states. That is, when you can actually split your system into smaller ones. And nevertheless, the impact was huge. Now, we are approaching the possibility of uh, producing microscopic quantum states, quantum coherent states, of a large number of uh, single particle states. So if we take so-called superconducting flux quantum bit, which roughly speaking is a superconducting loop with a Jettelson junction, in which current can flow simultaneously, clockwise and counterclockwise. This involves well, conservatively, several million single electron states. So your system is in superposition of states where several million electrons flow simultaneously, clockwise and counterclockwise, which is not quite macroscopic, but it is clearly not on the scale of, you know, first quantum experiments where you had one photon or one electron, something like this. And quantum technologies of the second wave, in the first place, of course, quantum computing, but this is, while the most celebrated, not the only, or the most feasible, or maybe the most useful application. They all essentially use large-scale quantum entanglement. I would say that we have, before, we had this kind of situation. If you recall the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, the idea was, well, we don't understand, really. We cannot imagine what's going on on the microscopic level, but we can describe it. And we don't care, actually, how we switch from quantum to classical description, because we just postulate that everything small is quantum, everything large is classical, and there is a boundary somewhere. Well, for 20 years now, we have no such rigid boundary. We have kind of a Schengen area, which in all probability will survive longer than actual Schengen area, where we can get large, uh, the quantum behavior on as large a scale as we wish, as long as we can fight effects which destroy quantum coherence. At least this is the picture. I would be happy to actually see some experiments running into kind of a solid wall, because it would give some guidance to our theory. But so far, we have to assume that no such solid wall actually exists. And just one consideration, which, uh, well, was brought... Yeah, so now, let's look at what we actually have here. This is our current state of business. Well, not current. This is what happened, say, almost 10 years ago. You have so-called phase qubit. I'm talking mostly about superconducting qubits because they are, at the moment, the most advanced ones, allowing to put together the biggest quantum structures. So, and the first phase qubits, this is just a Josephson junction, that is. You have a tunneling barrier between two superconductors, you bias it by current, and you produce a system with uh, two quantum states, and you can induce transitions by microwave illumination. So this is how it looks. 150 microns, this loops, this is a cold charge qubit, again. This is already a two qubit structure. This is small thing. This is a bit of superconductor, which can have either zero or one extra Cooper pair, just two electrons. 
and it can be in a superpositional states, which when it has none or one Cooper pair. So it can simultaneously have either of them, simultaneously. And here there are two such qubits together. And this was produced by the collaboration with D-Wave company. Uh, at the moment, it was the largest quantum structure in existence. It has these four superconducting loops, each of them a quantum bit, and in each of these loops, current can flow simultaneously in, those, in two directions. Uh, the spiral around is the readout device, and these pi-shaped loops produce the necessary bias. So this is something which was produced 10 years ago, and as I said, then it was the biggest thing in existence. And now you have D-Wave machines which contain a couple of thousand qubits. And this is not everything yet. Well, this is, by the way, the first commercial D-Wave processor. Each of these sticks is actually an elongated superconducting loop. So this is a qubit. And you have here four qubits in this direction, and a layer below them is another four qubits. So you have this eight qubits block. And altogether, it is 128 quantum bits. So this was the first one produced in 2010. Quite small, can, as you can see. And by the way, this slide rule is not here just for the scale. It's for a purpose. <laughs> A later one already contained about a thousand, and again, this is three years ago. Now there is a 2,000 bit structure, and this is something completely different, I mean, produced by a completely different group in Japan with over 4,000 flux qubits. It does not allow everything to do with them everything that a D-Wave processor does. You don't have individual control of them and so on, but so this is more like a material than a processor, but it's still very impressive. And you can do this, and the question is what you will do about it. So, now we can produce this multi-qubit arrays. Moreover, we know pretty well how each individual qubit does work. We can predict exactly behavior of a single qubit or, say, a 10, 20 qubit processor. You see these qubit simulators can run pretty efficiently. But if you try to do something about a device which contains several hundred or several thousand quantum bits, you run into a fundamental barrier. This fundamental barrier is the impossibility of efficient simulation of a large quantum system with classical computers. Reason is simple. If you want to solve this equation, you will be running out of memory, out of number of classical bits, or you will have to spend more time than the universe exists. Because the size of the Hilbert space, the formal way of describing behavior of quantum system, grows exponentially with the number of quantum bits. The only reason we've been very successful in developing quantum theory of a solid state of condensed matter was that we were not interested in all the wealth of a possible effects. We were not interested in large-scale quantum correlations. We were content to deal with one, two, three, four point Green's functions, where solutions are quite straightforward. So we need to go into something like engineering. And we need to develop different 
completely different set of rules and approaches. After all, humans have been very successful in engineering things way before, say, the modern mechanics of deformable bodies was developed. Egyptians and Romans were very good at what they were doing. And by the way, you know this uh, old canard about Romans not knowing uh, that, uh, you know, water will not, uh, will uh, certainly flow upwards if uh, you connect two vessels with a tube and they build their aqueducts because of their ignorance. Not at all. They simply knew that in order for this kind of uh, engineering, you would need solid, impenetrable tubes. Otherwise, water will simply leak out at the lowest place. And they didn't want to bother with that. They preferred to build aqueducts and use simple ceramic tubes without any seals and so on. But let's look at this. This is improvement in the quality of superconducting qubits over, say, 20 years, 16 years here. Actually, it is as drastic as develop a development as between the first Wright brothers uh, flying machine and what the Germans fielded uh, during the so-called Fokker summer during the First World War when they managed to pr practically sweep the Allied aircraft from the French skies because of superior design. Well, the Allies quickly developed even better aircraft. But at any rate, at any rate, in 15 years or so, from experimental things, you had a technology which had actual military and not just military applications. The problem is that, well, we can be optimistic. We have the same kind of development in the quantum, in quantum technologies, this kind of improvement in performance. But in order to produce a universal quantum computer which will do all these beautiful algorithms, we need something like coming from here to here. And it took us 80 years or so. And who wants to wait for 80 years? And moreover, we cannot actually afford this. Because if we don't try to build something, we will move nowhere. And this analogy with the aircraft industry is actually pretty precise. In uh, the early 20th century, all the equations which you need to solve to predict the behavior of an aircraft were known. Here it is, the Navier-Stokes equations for viscous fluid. And you couldn't solve them, of course. Of course, you had some general formulas, you had Joukowsky theorem, you knew you had Bernoulli principle, but this wouldn't actually help you build from scratch something which would fly. By the way, do you know that Einstein actually tried to contribute to German war effort by improving aircraft? Actually, he did. Again, from Zhukovsky theorem, he figured out that if you increase the curvature of the upper side of the aircraft wing, it will have a superior uh, aeronautical qualities. So he designed something, and this something was built. He called it, I think, the cat's spine, because of the, four, of the shape. And the test pilot managed to land it and said that he will never, ever come close to the thing again. <laughs> and uh, maybe this, to a certain extent, explains Einstein's reluctance uh, to write to President Roosevelt about the nuclear weapons. <laughs> After all, the result could be as bad. <laughs> but again, this was impossible to solve, but there existed scaling theory. There was no set of 
dimensionless parameters, Reynolds number, Froude number, so on, which allow to translate results of scaled experiments to the actual thing. Well, we are, and only recently, actually only after supercomputers were built, it became finally possible to model behavior of aircraft. And still you need experiments. Otherwise, you will have F-35 on your hands. So, this is another deceptively simple thing. Liouville equation for the density matrix, plus including the thing which uh, is responsible for non-unitary transformation. And this thing is not just impossible to solve now. It is fundamentally impossible to solve using classical computers for anything large enough. And if we be very optimistic and believe that there is no fundamental barrier on our way to building a universal quantum computer, at any rate, we cannot solve these equations until we build this big universal quantum computer. And we cannot build this big universal quantum computer until we can solve this equation so that we could properly design and characterize this computer. So the, this is not a pretty place to be. What shall we do? We need to develop quantum engineering. And engineering is all about accommodating incompatible requirements. For example, in quantum computer, you must have maximum control over qubits, but each control line brings with it extra sources of noise and decoherence, which will kill your fragile quantum states. You need to be able to produce some rule of thumb, approximate estimates, so that we could tell, at least in what ballpark the parameters of our system must be for it to work somehow. We need some heuristical approach. We need to be able to use scaling, that is, think about the ways how to translate experimental results obtained for a smaller, calculable, buildable, and controllable thing to something large, containing not 2,000 by maybe 2 million qubits. And after all, we must be able to predict the behavior of the large structure based on the behavior of its components. And all of the engineering is about building reliable systems based on absolutely unreliable elements. So as I said, we cannot. We cannot do this if we try naively to simply simulate, to simply trying to solve these equations. Well, of course we can try and build a standard quantum computing, a computer, universal quantum computer. We know that we need to be able to do precise operations on single qubits and a couple of qubits, pairs of qubits. This is the minimum we need to do. But the qubit lifetime is much shorter than time necessary for this operation. So we need to, uh, to employ quantum error correction. Fortunately, we can do this, at least in principle. Unfortunately, it requires encoding our qubits, logic qubits, into dozens of physical qubits, extending every logic operation into dozens, maybe more, of physical operations, bringing with it more decoherence, more requirements for precise control, and so on and so forth. Of course, we can try topological protection, but again, this is a game which, does not, which you don't know when it will end and how. So we need to do something. But the point is that at the moment, we simply do not have technology which would be good enough to build a practical universal quantum computer. This is the fact of life. We are very much, you know, desensitized to the difficulties of the whole thing by modern, very powerful computers. 
while even 50 years, 60 years ago, when uh, every bit was at the price of gold, and you could have half of your electronic valves blowing out before you finished your calculation. This was closer to the current situation. And at any rate, trying to emphasize only the algorithmic, algorithmic side of this and make existing technology good enough for this actually very overhead heavy way of quantum computing is indeed like trying to build a Pentium using all the blueprints but having only some steam age technology. It would be a fun project and writing software for this non-existent hardware would be also interesting, but in the 19th century, fortunately, people didn't go this way. When it turned out that Babbage's difference machine cannot be built, they just started using slide rules. And using slide rules, they made possible our modern computing. So people decided to follow this adage. So let's try, and we'll see what happens. Let's build big quantum structures, because only building large quantum structures, we can actually figure out what's going on. If we will wait until we make all these perfect quantum bits, we may wait for 100 years and go nowhere. I'm not going to say that this approach will be always useful or successful. Sometimes it leads to sp spectacular disasters. But, after all, invasion of uh, quantum domain, well, hardly will bring Kazakhs on your head, so you can risk it. So people suggested using something which does not, even for the field of quantum computing, something which does not necessarily require precise control over all quantum bits. This is called adiabatic quantum computing. The idea was brilliant. Suppose you somehow manage to encode the solution of your problem into the ground state of large quantum system. Actually, there are ways of doing this. Then, well, imagine that you have this, well, think of these qubits as uh, magnetic needles. And you create some very complex network of interactions between these needles. So in the ground state, in the lowest energy state, the configuration of these needles will give you the answer. Now, the problem is that if you have such complex interactions between these needles, if you just try to reach the ground state by cooling them down, you will most likely never reach the ground state they will behave like a glass, you know, like spin glass. You know, glasses are not really solids, they're liquids. They very slowly flow, but it will take you centuries for these glasses to crystallize, to get to their ground state. For something like a quantum computer, it will take you more than the lifetime of the universe. But fortunately, what you can do if there is this adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics, which says that if your system is in its ground state, then if you change its properties very slowly, it will remain in its ground state. Because simply, you know, this Peter's principle, you cannot fall from the floor. <laughs> it's never, nobody, nowhere to go. And if you have these magnetic needles and you apply very strong magnetic field so that they all lie in one direction, they're automatically in the ground state. Then you very slowly switch this field off. As a result, your system will remain in its ground state, but this ground state now will encode your solution. It will be very intrinsic, very intricate pattern of these needles, giving you the answer. So this is the ideal adiabatic quantum computer. In principle, this doesn't always work because you cannot do this infinitely slow. If you do it with finite speed, 
you will be excited and so on, and there will be noise. So you can do quantum annealing. This is when you allow your system to deviate a bit from the ground state, but it will drop in there in the end. This is quantum annealing. Or you can have approximate quantum computing, where even if your system is somewhere close enough to the ground state, it will give you a possible solution. Very good. So these are something like quantum slide rules, indeed. You have this kind of Hamiltonian, your initial Hamiltonian, and your final Hamiltonian. This one contains these in very complex connections between different qubits. This one is just a strong magnetic field, if you wish. You very slowly change this parameter lambda from 0 to 1, and your system, again very slowly, will follow your, and it will remain in the ground state. This was the first attempt that DWave made at demonstrating quantum adiabatic behavior. It didn't, uh, it didn't go well enough because of too high temperature, but it was actually very significant because it showed where we should be going. Again, this was for three qubits, so on. Yes, of course, you can have, you have the possibility that your system will be excited, but then it will either drop back, like in quantum annealing, or even if it is excited not too far, it will be not too far from the ground state, much closer to the ground state than if you try just to cool down your system. Now let's return to D-wave systems. Not because I had a hand with its uh, foundation and development, but the founding and development, but because it brought to head this key question: How do you characterize the quantum behavior of a quantum system, which you simply cannot simulate using? classical computers. You know, there was quite a lot of controversy. So this is one of these D-Wave processors. And so this is not even the current version. The current version had closer to, to uh, over 2,000 bits. And quantum operation was actually rigorously confirmed on the experiment with 8-qubit register, sub-register of this. The problems was, Decohere and uh, actually, the, these processors demonstrate some algorithms specifically written for adiabatic approach, like image recognition or image processing, which worked. Actually, adiabatic quantum computer is very good for optimizing things. And optimization can be very useful, very important. Take uh, for example, the logistic problems, traveling salesmen. Actually, the existential threat coming from quantum computers is not directed at, you know, spy agencies. It is at not even at banks, but it is directed at the world financial system. Because if you manage to optimize the economy on the global scale, who needs bankers? The problem is that these things operate, they are slow, you need to change them slow. But their, uh, the time of this evolution is much longer than the decoherence time of a single qubit. Question is, how come that they still work? Now, there were several, you know, successful or unsuccessful attempts to determine how much faster the thing works. One uh, disproved claim was that it is 3,000 uh, 3, times faster uh, than conventional computers. Another still standing is that it can be 100 million times faster for certain problems. So this is, and this is uh, actually what people have to do to compare. There is no approach so far which would let you tell how well it performs and whether it performs at all, the only thing you can tell is you compare 
the average operation of this. So you generate a very large number of sample problems. You run your quantum device through all the sample problems. You develop some statistics. Then you run some approximate solvers and conventional computers across the same gamut of problems, and you get their statistics. Then you compare the statistics, and then you make conclusions. Well, if these statistics are similar, like here and here, then likely that this uh, quantum annealer made by D-Wave actually was behaving as a quantum system. While if you try to simulate it using some classical approach, they're very dissimilar, so therefore it must be quantum. And then people invented more complex and very much contrived classical model, which reproduced certain things which D-Wave demonstrated. Then people from D-Wave developed, and the collaborators developed another test, which showed that on that test, this contrived model gives results different from what the statistics for D-Wave machine does, and so on. So there is no conclusive answer to this yet. So this is where we are standing right now. We don't have a reliable way of uh, telling to what degree a machine like D-Wave is quantum, what is the effect of actually quantum behavior, and moreover, and more important, what should we change? How should we improve this to behave better? How do we predict its performance if we cannot simulate it? And this is what we need to do. We, and actually, the speed up is not a very important scientifically thing. It is important from the point of view of investors, it is important from the point of view of uh, customers, but it is actually a very minor thing from the point of view of science. You need some better things to evaluate the quantumness of a quantum computer. And this grand challenge still stands. We don't know what are the good criteria for measuring the quantumness of a quantum computer. Because the standard way of you know, measuring the degree of quantumness of a quantum state, like quantum state tomography, is not efficient. You need exponential number of measurements. You will not be able to do this when you have a few thousand qubits or even a few hundred qubits. And we need to bring, bridge this gap when we already cannot classically evaluate and optimize the existing quantum arrays, but on the other hand, these quantum arrays are still too small to serve as quantum computers capable of analyzing the behavior of quantum systems. So we need to find some way around this. We already have useful, very useful applications, but the question is, what to do in order to make these applications work. We need to develop better theoretical and computational tools, and we cannot develop them along the lines of brute force, because we know that brute force, any brute force we develop, will not be enough. So we need to develop this structural quantum engineering. So that at least on average, we should be able to tell what is the kind of behavior that we should expect. If take seriously this analogy with hydrodynamics, we should think along the lines of finding some set of uh, dimensionless parameters which characterize qualitatively different regimes of operation of a quantum system. We may be unable to actually describe these regimes in detail, but we should be able to at least establish their existence. And then 
we could investigate these different regimes by investigating small-scale models. Say, even if you cannot calculate something which happens in an array of a thousand qubits, you certainly could be measuring its behavior. And then you could say that the behavior of an array with a million quantum bits with the same set of dimensionless parameters would be, to a certain degree, the same as what we observed on this scale model. At least this would give us some guidance towards what to try and what to expect. This is what I call the engineering approach to quantum technologies. If you look at this pyramid of engineering, you have unit engineering where we are pretty finished. Behavior of single quantum bits, be it superconductor or semiconductor or based on uh, some impurities in crystal lattice or photonic qubits, uh, this is a pretty much done deal. And uh, we can do straightforward simulation of anything which contains a few dozen qubits with more and more sophisticated models for noise and so on. Where we got stuck so far is here. We cannot predict yet the behavior of a large quantum system based on the behavior of its unit elements. Well, in systems engineering, it would be, well, when we are successful here, this will be a question how you best design the interface, well, more or less like putting beautiful icons or connecting your quantum computer to another computer through ICP, TP, whatever protocol. So at the moment, as I said, we are stuck here. And uh, this is actually a very interesting thing because here engineering and science are still one and the same thing. We should feel privileged to be at the stage where, well, on the same line, of course not the same scale, but at least in the same line as Euler, who was doing engineering work, or Zhukovsky. People, or heaviside, where you have the development of science actually pushed forward by the needs of engineering and the other way around. So, any questions before I switch to something a little different? Yes. Maybe, uh, what, uh, yes, so. Uh, do you think other media or other quantum systems that you mentioned, I mean, Josephson Junction yeah. or optics, in which the correlation of quantum state is much slower, can help to understand better um, quantum calculations or uh, mm, mm, give more background for making theory? I'm afraid not. Uh, the difficulty is not with improving individual qubits. The difficulty is with the impossibility of prediction of behavior of their large systems. So whether this uh, qubit will be, say, some microscopic uh, NV center in diamond or double quantum dot or a photon polarization. Unfortunately, this is still the same problem. We can, we can easily calculate something for 10 qubits. We cannot calculate anything for, say, 100. So, Uh, maybe I'm going to say something really stupid, but can't we use, um, maybe have kind of an NP approach and uh, use a quantum computer to solve a problem that a quantum computer should be able to solve and that right now we are not able to solve and then test the solution? 
Well, this would be, of course, uh, the, uh, the smoking gun thing. Unfortunately, as I said, we, uh, the systems we are capable of building are not powerful enough to solve something that conventional computer cannot solve. So, of course, if uh, we had, you know, some black box which can break RSA code, it wouldn't really matter whether it is built of uh, superconducting qubits or, you know, eggshells. It would be in itself a proof. Here, of course, Wright brothers were in a better situation. Either their contraption could fly or it couldn't. With uh, quantum computers at the moment, as I said, one of the difficulties is you cannot properly establish whether they are working at all, whether what they're doing is actually due to quantum processes or maybe some strange classical processes or some quantum assisted things. I believe that, say, what these adiabatic things do is actually quantum. And I'm working on some ideas how to quantify this, just too early to tell. But this is the actual problem we, are, we have to face right now. Can I make yes, a question? Please, yes. Um, we saw from the first day we had the presentation on the history of computing. And one of the, the, the things which was said there was at a certain point there was this merging between logic yes. and arithmetics. Between, and somehow I got the sensation that somehow this is a technology specific for numerics, not for logics, and that the, the, what we saw before uh, was more a, 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 a technology for logic rather than for numericus. Can you comment on this? Is, is this a good vision? Uh, well, uh, I'm afraid I can't. What I can say is that uh, we, are, we will be better off at the moment if we treat quantum computers as analog devices right. rather than digital devices. In order to do things digital, they have this advantage, of course, of uh, uh, controlled precision, universality, but you pay a lot in the form of overheads. As we all know, the analog devices starting with, well, using such th simple things as uh, the slide rules, or if you wish to go into some ancient history, this anti-guitar mechanism, something which, uh, which an in analog way produces your result. Uh, they require much lower overheads and they could be much better uh, fit for our current low level of development of these quantum technologies. Well, we do have steam age uh, technology in this respect, so let's build uh, steam engines. <laughs> You said you you said we are not yet in a position to build quantum computers that can solve any of these problems. Uh, what can you solve at the moment? Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying, I did I did not say that we cannot solve any problems. We don't have at the moment equipment to build a universal quantum computer which will model another quantum computer. It is quite possible, and I believe that it is possible, that an analog quantum computer, or quantum solar, call it whatever you like, would produce results good enough to characterize large enough quantum system, would predict the classes, well, the uh, different regimes of its operation. But we need to treat it they said as an analog device, as analog simulator, not as a universal computer. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, so far there was too much inertia from, you know, huge successes of uh, computer science where you could simply forget completely about the background, about the cost of doing actual operations. Only now, when you try to model 
such systems as quantum computers, you find out that you need to fight for every byte of information, every byte of memory, every operation. And this is a useful lesson, I would say. So we should try and think back to the time when we had analog devices doing pretty good job. is that we don't have programmable quantum computers, but we have quantum computers that are somehow have the, program, the, the problem hard-coded into the hardware. Yes. Right? So what type of pro uh, problems do yeah. these quantum computers yeah. solve? Yeah. At the so moment? this, uh, as I said, optimizing, optimization problems. So finding... What do they pay for? Look, uh, I am... I don't uh, want the details, no, no, I just I want know, what no, type of problems. No, no, well, I wouldn't be able to tell you details for the simple reason. I don't work for DWA for over 10 years already. I am a founder, I am a shareholder, but I fortunately I have nothing to do with its day-to-day uh, -day operation, which actually gives me freedom to do research in whatever direction I like. So I'm afraid I can't. I, I don't know what exactly Google pays DVA for. I know that, uh, well, this is from their public release, that some uh, Japanese company uh, paid DVA for the help in, uh, I think, uh, optimizing uh, a railway schedule, something like this. Mm -hmm. So the problems of optimizing, they are natural ones for uh, this kind of uh, adiabatic devices. Even when you have not the best solution, mm -hmm. you can have very good solution. So, and uh, tuning the things is not that hard, actually. Because, well, after all, analog devices for solving systems of equations, where you need to turn knobs to change resistances and so on, been in existence for decades and they've worked pretty nice. Or if you take, say, uh, every anti-aircraft gun has, in addition to all the optics and electronics, also a simple mechanical sighting device. Why? Because when everything else fails, the things will still work well enough. You don't want your gun to become you know, silent just because some battery is flat. <laughs> to some extent, it's a, a dedicated yes. processor yes. for minimization or optimization exactly. that accelerates calculations, yes. not only in, in terms of time, probably uh, dimensions, yes. size of the problem. Yes, so this doesn't have, to, as I said, it doesn't have to be a universal thing. Of course, if and when we build universal quantum computers, I'm sure no computer classical or quantum can predict all the idiotic ways people will be using uh, these devices when they are become available. I am absolutely sure that Gabor would never ever think about the laser show. <laughs> okay, uh, may I continue? So this is a bit of uh, this uh, quantum steam engine. So even if we cannot build a quantum computer. We already have plenty of pretty good quantum bits. So can we do something about this? Yes, we can. If we take this big, large number of quantum bits, put them together, and manage to keep them at low enough temperature, and in a noiseless enough situation, they can show pretty interesting Things. Just think about a quantum coherent optical medium. For example, and uh, for it to be quantum coherent, it needs only to be quantum coherent on the scale of the electromagnetic pulse running through this. And then you can have something similar to meta usual metamaterials, but now with a quantum twist to it. So it's not just quantum corrections to the properties of metamaterials. This is essentially quantum things. And 
a quantum computer, especially a diabetic quantum computer, can be considered as a special, complex, single-purpose quantum material. Uh, by the way, the things, prototypes have been built already, and some proof-of-principle experiments are already almost 10 years old. So this quantum material, the first idea is that you have a series of quantum bits in a waveguide. If you play with their quantum state, you can have, you see this, uh, band structure, but this band structure depends on the quantum state of each qubit. So if this qubit is in a superposition of states and undergoes quantum bits, then the whole thing will depend on time. So you have this breathing quantum structure. And your light will be either going through or being reflected depending on the time. You can play with this in different ways, but what you can do is, with these things, you can test macroscopic quantum effects. You test limits of quantum mechanics, because I still would really love to see some place where quantum mechanics breaks down. It would be really great. And we could put our names to the equations. <laughs> but short of that, we would have to test new theoretical methods. And of course, you can have applications. For example, you can try and do an uh, inverse double slit experiment. Send in a classical signal at something where each slit is in superposition of open and closed state. This was a proof of principle when a single quantum bit was put in a waveguide, and it turned out that it behaves exactly as predicted as a quantum, a point-like quantum scatter. Uh, some interesting standard uh, quantum optics things have been observed, and so the effects which were seen only in atoms were seen in these large microns across things, and the coupling of this qubit to the electromagnetic field is much stronger than in case of standard atoms. So you can play with this. I will probably skip through this whole thing. Ah, yeah, this would be interesting. You can create a quantum material which is in the superposition of states with positive and negative refractive indices. So in principle, it can be in the superposition of states with any two refractive indices, but having its left and right simultaneously kind of ambidextrous would be most interesting. There was no experiment uh, to this effect yet, but it is quite feasible. And then you would have this classical signal which gets entangled with the state of this medium with interesting results. Again, these are some just theoretical predictions. Uh, you can do this in principle again with, say, decorated photonic crystals, and uh, this is an interesting example of quantum superposition. Uh, this is uh, information about this first quantum metamaterial uh, demonstration. But you see, uh, the English-speaking uh, uh, sources called it the triumph of German researchers. Russian-speaking uh, uh, sources called it the result of Russian research. And actually, it was done by the same people, in the same place. <laughs> so, but at any rate, uh, we have predicted such effects as lasing in this uh, system, such effects uh, and the chaotization of quantum state. Uh, then uh, uh, another group predicted uh, also lasing as well as uh, self-induced transparency. Uh, then uh, we expect effects similar to superradiance. Again, this still waits for experimental confirmation. And uh, again, this is another group in uh, Japan that also predicted 
these effects in a little different setup. And now this group that made this few thousand bits, now uh, they are working together with another Japanese group to bring about a very large few million qubit uh, worth of uh, quantum annealer. So, and these are some predicted properties for a birefringent quantum metamaterial. Then there are some ideas how to use this thing for sensing and imaging, but I will probably skip this because it will take too long, uh, with uh, trying to make a material which, in a way, similar to, you know, non, uh, you know this uh, non-reflecting uh, non coating for glasses, for lenses, where you kill uh, the reflected beam before it forms. We could try and kill the noise and extra inf and unnecessary information in your signal before it actually hits your detectors through the non-demolition uh, measurement of the signal through by layers of these quantum bits and uh, properly organized feedback. You can test some interesting predictions of quantum mechanics. This thing was just uh, published in scientific reports again. Unfortunately, this is still theory, but it would be interesting to do the experiment. And we can do all kinds of, inter of different theoretical approaches, which, again, uh, better be left for some future discussions. So what I want uh, to say now is this. Let me switch, uh, jump to the impact. Do I have four more minutes? Yeah. Yeah, good. I will not need much more. So, the impact. In the UK, for example, there are several reports by different government organizations um, predicting large impact of this. Uh, they do not bet on superconducting technology, unfortunately, but at least they realize the scale of possible uh, impact on technology and everything. And World Economic Forum has this big picture of where quantum everything would lead. This is about recent, well, data of 2015, expen uh, expenditure on uh, quantum technologies. So as you can see, half billion euro a year from the European Union, 220 from China and 30 from Russia, and you never know how much goes there actually. Same for the United States, I would say. And everybody is playing this game. And this is just uh, government expenditure. You know that we have something else too. Uh, the predictions of uh, commercial markets, of course, vary wildly. You can Value, uh, you can uh, value such companies the way as anything from uh, 100 million to 100 billion dollars and who knows how much vo dollar would uh, be worth by the time of the IPO. But at least there is understanding that you can do certain useful things already now. And the most stimulating thing is that doing this engineering, you also do science. This is the thing I mentioned about the Japanese made, uh, major Japanese effort uh, with the annealing machine with a large number of quantum bits, superconducting bits. And uh, this is something about different regimes of operation. So, but we need actually to build quantum structural engineering of these devices in order for all of this to happen. And the last, but not least, we should never overestimate the impact of bare technology. Technology by itself can be put to any use. It is what we learn while developing this technology that matters. Okay, thank you.
time for one or two questions. Hey, sorry. So I was saying that we might have time for one or two questions from the audience. We already had some questions before. So if anyone wants to uh, make a question. Can I make comments to what? Comments is a, are equally good. What is shown now, so in Tertis there was a famous statement of Polish mathematician, I've forgotten his name, and he was telling his family that he's not going to buy a radio for the family <laughs> because although the radio was invented, but still uh, programs uh, on that, that are worthy to listen has been okay. invented. Can. Well, uh, maybe, you know, speaking of uh, this, you know, the Polish writer Stanislav Jerzyletz once said, well, so you use your head to break through the wall. What are you going to do in the neighboring uh, prison cell? <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you, speaker, again. Thank you. thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you.